chest in. I'd like to think that if I was, I would pop. <laughs> Seriously, you can't hear me? Okay. okay, can you hear me in the back now? Talk, talk louder. All right. Hi, and uh, welcome to uh, Interface Design for Hacking Tools. Uh, my name is uh, Greg Conti, and I uh, just finished up three years teaching uh, computer science at West Point. So if I have anyone in the crowd who's uh, under 22 that uh, wants to go there, come see me afterwards. I'd be happy to uh, talk to you about it. Or not. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dark Tangent and Black Beetle and all the people who are working so hard to keep this, uh, this event going and uh, keep us uh, out of the fire marshal's uh, bad graces. All right, uh, first I'd like to start off with a couple of quick questions. Uh, just a quick show of hands to uh, see, uh, just to get a feel for the vibe of the audience. Um, who thinks if someone wants to learn a tool, uh, they should learn how to use the command line? You know, like the command line is the center of the universe, and if you don't know the if you don't know the command line, you ain't crap. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the next question is, who thinks the uh, GUI is something you do at the end after you've done all the hardcore back end coding? The GUI is something you put together at the at the end. Okay, kind of. If it works for you, it, that's, that's all it counts. Okay, last question. Who likes the paper clip in Microsoft Office? Uh, I see one. Okay. First off, this is the United States uh, Army Disciplinary Barracks at uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Um, this is where I'll end up if I don't do uh, the disclaimer. Jackbooted thugs and black helicopters will uh, land on my front lawn. Uh, this is my own. I'm here as a private citizen. I don't represent the Army. I don't represent the government or West Point. Uh, first, we'll have a, a little bit on what Dilbert thinks about uh, interface design. Do, do engineers normally design user interfaces? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll try and talk about how to avoid interface poisoning. You don't want your users uh, dying on you. <clears throat> First, uh, we'll take a quick look at, uh, I need to defuse the whole command line versus GUI argument, um, or I uh, might as well paint a big bullseye on my chest to start, the, start off. Then we'll cover a quick run through some of the basic principles. And this is a 101 track, so what I tried to uh, focus on is um, a survey of what's out there because in, in 50 minutes there's not enough time to uh, to cover the whole field but I'll give you a, 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 a broad brush approach and then we'll go in depth on um, I've done some redesigns of a couple of uh, hacking tools that are out there and uh, we'll also uh, cr critique some tools finally I'll end up with some uh, pointers and the pointers are also on your CD I put all the links out there of where you can go to for more information if you're interested First off, the, uh, you always have to begin with a uh, textbook de definition of an interface. But I think what's really important here is this is the public face. This is what your users see. Uh, if it looks good, then that really matters. Okay, if it looks like crap, and what do you think? Are user interfaces in security tools out there well designed? You can just pick them up and just go to town? Or are they a very painful process where you have to... Uh, work your way through it. And I think most of the people in this room are the advanced users that you can figure it out. You enjoy figuring it out. But if you have a product or if you're giving your tool away for free and you want to get a large degree of acceptance, you know, if there's a competitor out there that has something that's easier to use, even if yours might be a little bit better and uh, on the back end, you could run into some problems. People tend to gravitate towards uh, software that they can actually use. Imagine that. <coughs> First off, I'm going to defuse this whole command line versus GUI thing. There's a time and a place for each. Uh, I'm going to talk about GUIs today. Traditionally, the uh, command line is for power users. Uh, it's very flexible. If you're good at it, it, uh, it can be very uh, time, uh, very efficient. And it's best uh, for, like I said, advanced and heavy users. 
you know, clearly you can write, uh, and I use Perl in these examples, arguably command line stuff, but uh, you, can, you can write crack, uh, crack uh, passwords in one line of Perl. You can crack DVD encryption in just a few lines. Trinity uh, was able to hack the mainframe in uh, Matrix 2 with a command line. All sorts of good things. We'll, uh, we'll take a run through. Now, this is, if you take nothing else away from this, this is, this is what to take away, that you start off with your tasks, look at the tasks your users are going to accomplish, um, take a look at who your users are. Your users aren't necessarily just like you, and then the technology follows from that. Uh, this, uh, first the graphic here, this is a uh, traditional army uh, task of painting rocks in front of the battalion headquarters. So I thought that would be uh, good for example of a task. But bottom line is take a look at when you're writing your code, think about it. What are your users trying to do? What are the common things they're trying to do? In, uh, in Black Hat, Phil Zimmerman was talking about um, P, uh, PGP and the difficulty uh, people had making it work because hiding the, uh, the infrastructure, the, encrypts, the encryption decryption infrastructure was difficult. Uh, but that's the task. I mean, people love to have one button encrypt, another button decrypt. And the closer you can come to that goal, the easier it can be on everyone involved. So taking a hard look at the tasks is the, the starting point. Next step is to take a look at your users. Like I said, your users aren't like you. Uh, necessarily, or they may be just like you. You may your user may be uh, just a small uh, group of people in your immediate, you know, town or something like that. That's okay. But what you want to do is give them a chance to sit down and take a look at what you're coming up with earlier in the design process rather than later. And a little bit of time up front can go a long way. Uh, you know, half hour, two hours, sitting them down and letting them look at it can go a long way to uh, saving a lot of time and effort down the road. And I took these off uh, Usenet. I had a couple of others, but uh, I didn't think I didn't want a lot of profanity in there talking about. So you could have beginners, or you could have advanced people. You have the whole range of people. You may have unexpected people using your your program. If it gains wide acceptance, you could have a whole range of people trying to use it, and you want them saying good things. You may have international users. This is an example from a, a McAfee's virus scan. Um, you know, targeted to an international audience, another audience. And then once you've taken a look at the task and the users, then the technology follows. So, you know, generally engineers, myself included, we, I like to sit down and start and then down the road um, add these things in later. But if you can spend a little time up front, it can be time well spent. Okay, and this will be a quick survey through some of the core principles of design. And uh, no, I don't own a Macintosh or anything like that, um, th which are the traditional machines for graphic designers. This, uh, but we'll, we'll take a quick run through this. Each one of these is really, a whole, there's like whole courses in each of these areas. But I want to give you enough so you're familiar with the term, um, the ter basic terminology. If you want more information, you'll know how to look for it. Cognitive science is what's going on in the user's mind, what type of framework. And there's also, it, the, I'm going to be giving you rules of thumb as we go through. These rules of thumb are essentially are best practices, and they've evolved by uh, a, a variety of testing, people in lab coats, videotaping people behind silvered mirrors, uh, observing how they react different, with different uh, pieces of software. So there's a whole body of research out there. We're not going to cover it, uh, but I did want to show you some of the rules, in qu quote, rules. Um, and then from there, you can, uh, at least if you're going to violate the rules, that's fine. But at least have, you know, know you're violating the rules and you're doing it for a reason. A good example is uh, Fitz's Law. Fitz's Law, and I know this sounds like rocket science, but when, you, when you're writing software, it, or if someone's trying to click on a region on the screen, the bigger it is, the easier it is to acquire. Imagine that. So the bigger it is, the easier it is to acquire. And if you look, for those of you staying in Caesar's Palace, there's one big button on the uh, elevator. Can anyone tell me what it was? Yeah, the casino button. It doesn't say hotel lobby. It says casino, and it's about you know six times bigger than all the other buttons because they want you to find that. And they're, you know the hotels have been in business here in Las Vegas a long time, and a lot of psychology goes into trying to separate you from your money. 
Um, this is an example I, I, I pulled off the web of just a, a real complicated interface that uh, sometimes advanced users have a hard time with. We'll go into more depth in a little while. But the idea is you want your user interface to be intuitive and to allow exploration without people sticking uh, a finger in their eye, accidentally uh, reformatting their hard drive or crashing the system at the other end, if possible, to uh, give them a way out. And also the idea of consistency is if you have commands uh, throughout the program, they should be named the same way. Um, you shouldn't you know, change, change terminology, change placement of buttons, anything like that. It can confuse people. This is an example. Uh, this is a parody by uh, Dak uh, Rangus, who uh, actually gave me, I asked him about uh, using it in this, he gave me permission. Uh, but it's a parody of the Amazon tab navigation structure. Um, sometimes you'll see tools out there with all sorts of navigation all at the top level. And this uh, illustrates that, you know, beware going too far. Um, and we'll talk about techniques to, to counter that. But the bottom line is you can put the core stuff up front and then hide some of the additional uh, functionality and maybe an advanced section or something along those lines. Uh, this is also a parody website um, about color. And I know there's certain like classic um, hacker website colors, and you know that's that's your decision. But at least here's the textbook uh, thoughts on it. People need contrast. Uh, that's why it's harder sometimes to uh, drive uh, at night. Uh, people actually people prefer light backgrounds with dark dark colors. If you get away from that, you can run into problems. Uh, color choices. If you have too many colors, then it looks like a Technicolor vomit and it, people have a hard time. If you selectively use your colors, then you can bring drug people's attention to what you want to draw their attention to. And uh, here's a couple of examples. In the top left is, uh, again, from the parody website. And I have all these documented. And the, on your CD is the, is the briefing. And there's links to all of these if you want to go out and mess around with them <laughs> or not. Um, the, uh, the top left has, uh, the, with the cross flags and green lettering, a uh, very busy background. Probably the people in the back have a hard time reading it. Actually, probably the people in the front have a hard time reading it. But you see websites that look like that. But then you look at some of the other websites, like you know, professional ones focused on, um, on hardcore uh, user, you know, just basic functionality. The bottom left, Google, very clear, very straightforward. And if you look to the right, and first a word about Jacob Nielsen. I don't know. Who's heard of Jacob Nielsen? Yeah, Jacob Nielsen um, in the uh, graphic design community, I've heard him described as the Antichrist. Uh, because he's, he is bare bones functionality. Um, nothing uh, that, that detracts from usability needs to be there. And that's his website. It's very easy to use. It's pretty boring, but it's very easy to use. Um, and also, if, if any of you decide to be uh, Jacob Nielsen fans, you can visit his website, which is useit.com. He has 57 high-resolution pictures of himself. <laughs> uh, I think they'd make great wallpaper or t-shirts. Seriously, I counted them all. There's 57. Um, but anyway, if, if you're looking for more inspiration on, um, on more, putting some more design into it, um, the left are just two examples. And on the right, I'd, uh, I'd recommend uh, coolhomepages.com. It's not so much, it, it's more web-focused. Web it's not focused on uh, generally de you know, traditional applications. But uh, they've got a, a tremendous amount of websites, all categorized and ranked. So you can go out there. If you're looking for inspiration, highly recommend uh, taking a look at the, a look at the site. Fonts. Uh, the, again, the rules. The rules are limit the number of fonts. Um, what you're trying to do is avoid the uh, ransom note uh, situation. And with, uh, with the fonts, a couple of fonts, limit them, use bold. If you bold everything, nothing's bold. If you lose, use all uppercase, it's harder for people to read. Uh, but th those are the basic ideas. But be conscious of the fonts you're using and, uh, and limit them if you can, if you want to. Metaphor. Metaphor is something that's very powerful. It allows people to map from a known concept to an unknown concept, uh, but they can only be pushed uh, too far. You can, two examples that are way overdone are on the right. The top right is uh, the town metaphor. Um, and it can, if you take a look at it uh, later, it's very confusing. Some of the labels are hard to just figure out what's in the, the, What's the difference between the conference center and the training center and the learning center? What's, what's the difference? 
Bottom right is another overused metaphor, uh, the library. So a lot of real estate's being used up for something that's confusing. But a metaphor can be very powerful. Um, take the classic uh, tape deck. It maps very well. People can pick up Winamp and, and immediately use it. Even if you put a, a snowboarder on top of it and, and uh, distort the buttons, you can still pick up and feel, figure out how to use uh, that particular Winamp skin pretty easily. So if you can find a way, and you know, other metaphors, you know, control panels, dashboards, those are things that people can relate to. And, uh, the, and Microsoft was big on the uh, desktop metaphor. Uh, we, talked, we already talked about uh, consistency, so I'm not going to go into it um, a whole lot. But people have, there are certain expectations people have that things will stay, be in locations they looked for them in the past. The uh, like keyboard shortcuts. Key, keyboard shortcuts should be consistent throughout the program. If you've seen people, say, in uh, Photoshop, really proficient at it, they can make it sing and dance. And it's because it's all, there's a tremendous amount of keyboard shortcuts. They've been consistent through all the versions, or in, in generally, and it's uh, extremely powerful. Feedback. And you've, I'm sure you've all encountered this, certainly on the web. There's different tiers of feedback that, again, this is driven by psychology experiments. But if, at the lowest level is 0.1 of a second. People expect if you click on a button, that button's going to give you some sort of feedback at all the press in 0.1 of a second. What happens if, you, uh, if there's no response in, in, in that, a short period of time? Yeah. People, people just start clicking, 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 and then God knows what will happen. The, the next level is about one second. After they've clicked on the button, people are going to start looking for uh, the reaction. You know, should the, the button come, uh, a window pop up, or some sort of immediate reaction. If you get beyond that, uh, beyond one second, say up to 10 seconds, uh, that's when you, you, you should start thinking about some other type of feedback. And generally what's recommended is the, uh, turning the cursor into an hourglass, but not forever because you don't know if the machine's locked up, but generally for about 10 seconds. Uh, beyond about 10 seconds, that's when you start looking at uh, uh, some other type of uh, feedback, like the prog progress uh, indicator in the bottom right. It, sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly how long it's going to take. But something, you could, it can be a rough estimate or refine it as, as the uh, code goes along. It, uh, it can be extremely powerful, though, to let them know, hey, I can go get a cup of coffee, I can work on other things, and, and that type of thing. Testing is, is another area that you can take a look at. And actually, if, you, if, you, this is, you know, if you're keeping a short list of things to take away, is testing. It doesn't have to be extremely painful. It can be quick, down, and dirty. But the idea is finding users, people who are going to be the type of people who are using your program, sit them down in front of it and observe how they use it. Maybe give them a list of things to do and see what they're clicking on, what they're thinking. Get some feedback. It can be quick. And, uh, rel and you, if you do it earlier in the design process rather than later, it can save you time down the road. And for, I know a lot of people in here are doing you know, extreme programming, getting their code down and dirty, getting it out on the street. Uh, but if you, you know, are really trying to make an impact, then you know, think about iteration. You see next versions of software. So you can take the feedback you can, the second time around uh, and, ma and, and make it better. Another uh, big, big area is information visualization. And this is just uh, raw data from the uh, command line. But information visualization struggles to find ways, better ways to present information to the users. So here's the same information presented in uh, XTraceRoute and NeoTrace. And you can see that you know, you know, depending on what your application is, it can be very powerful to give people a, uh, a better idea of what's going on versus the raw data. Same thing, here's a uh, data set from TCP dump. But then, as, as you've seen, uh, that type of data uh, in Ethereal, it's broken down by the uh, different layers of the OSI model. You can, you can see really what's going on, much more functional visualization of the data. So I mean, we don't have time to go into it. I'll point you to more information. But this is an extremely powerful area, and it's worth uh, thinking about. Another way, again, to look at it, uh, not just the Ethereal way, is in Etherate, same basic set of data, and it shows another visualization of it. OK, we'll take a quick run through with uh, GUI components. And like I said, I'll give, these are just the rules in quotes. Um, I'll take a quick run through, then we'll get to uh, taking a look at some example programs. 
uh, radio buttons. The idea is it's a one-to-many control. You know, only one can be active at any time, and trying to limit them to six is the general design guideline, as well as setting a default. So I, I have some examples here. This uh, up here, there's, uh, there's no default set. That's something to think about. One radio button really doesn't make any sense. What you're shooting for are checkboxes, in that case, if it's just an on-off function. And then if you have a long list, it, uh, it, can, be a, it can be a problem. That's uh, n not in any particular order. If you did have a long list, then you put them in alphabetical order or something or group them by functionality, uh, put some space, you know, spacing in there to group them logically. Again, a uh, checkbox is just basic true-false um, true, false, uh, statements, and the general guidelines 12 per group. So you can see here, I used, um, I just grouped, grouped them a little bit better. It makes them a lot easier to take a look at. And on the right, these examples are an improper use. In the background, you only have one background color, so it can be confusing to people if you have, you know, if you're not using a radio button. And there's just an obvious example of putting too many. You think this is, you know, you think I'm making this up, but if you, t if you come out of here a little more tuned in when you leave, take a look, you'll see these, these things out there. Um, so it does happen, and it's good to know about it going into it. You know, as you're designing the GUI, you can, you can prevent this right off the bat. The uh, big thing to take away with dialog boxes and Windows is very, uh, makes it very painful is uh, too many levels. So what some people will do is they'll sketch out a tree of what, what windows uh, connect to what and trying to limit the levels. Generally, the levels are, should be limited to two. That's the rule. And other, other concepts are, in, say, in Visual Basic, you can code it either way, are uh, two terms, modal and mode less. Modal means it, it forces you to, it locks everything up, and, and you can't take any other action until that window's been acted on. And a good example of that is in the lower left, right here. That's in, uh, say, in Microsoft Word, if you want to send it the, as an attachment, there's an option file, send, uh, send as attachment. It locks up your Outlook, and it locks up your Microsoft Word. You can't do anything else. It can be very frustrating if that loses focus and it's behind some other window. You don't know what's going on. <coughs> there are also... Well, <laughs> yes, this, this is a good example of a modal dialogue. <laughs> Just kidding. You can only talk about GUI components so long before people start passing out. So I'm going to, you know, I thought a blue screen of death would wake everybody up. Uh, menus, the thing here to think about is the wording that you use and how long. This is an example from Ultra Edit, very long uh, menu list. And they have grouped it, they put lines in there, gray separator lines that help, uh, help alleviate some of the problems. But you can also see some of the terms they use can be confusing. There's open and quick open. There's no, uh, they don't have shortcuts for all, all the different options. So if you're going to do that, at least think about what you're not putting shortcuts for. I, I like Ultra Edit, but uh, the menus are a little long. <clears throat> Another thing, and it's not just with menus, it's anything on an interface, if it changes, a user's expected to be where it was last time. If things are changing on them, and the textbook example of, uh, of it is in uh, Microsoft Office again, you have the uh, short menu. That's what's on by default. If you, uh, it, that's what's on by default, um, but there's, it's hiding all that other functionality. So the first time most of the people I know uh, set up in Microsoft Office is they turn that off so they can see the whole thing. So think about it. If you have buttons, the labels are changing and that type of thing, it can confuse people. If you're going to do it, at least be conscious that it can confuse people. I won't go into uh, too much depth on labels, but the, the big thing here is trying to be conscious that you're, programmer jargon doesn't necessarily meet equal what the users are going to be thinking it means. So to try and find out, use the user's terminology, not, uh, not your own. They may be the same thing, and that's okay. The other uh, key component here is the labels are, users associate 
the label with a, a certain component on the uh, on the form or on the uh, on the GUI the closest one to it. So you want to put the labels closer to your that, that component it relates to the, rather than uh, a lot of spacing because they may think it belongs to something else. Again, this sounds simple, but you'll see it. <coughs> uh, key problems here in uh, text fields uh, are making them large enough. Uh, you sometimes see people with a you know, file, uh, load, loading files and that type of thing are selecting files and they'll give you a little window, you know, one inch window for six inches of information. So if possible, make them larger rather than smaller. And if, if there's a common default, if it's the same thing over and over and over again, you can pre-fill that in for somebody. This is real. This is from uh, Microsoft Excel. I went in and th I didn't move anything around. I just turned on all the, uh, all the different menus. Uh, icons, you can overdo it. And this is something you'll see. If you have to, one school of thought is, if you're using a program and you have to use the tooltip over and over and over to figure out what the icon means, then maybe you don't want to use an icon. Maybe you want to just put the text there or something like that. Uh, and a, a good example of this too is icons don't, don't um, translate very well between cultures. What, um, what does this mean in, for Americans in the room? What number, for example? Two. Okay, any Brits in the room? What does this mean in British? Yeah, it means, it means F U in, in Great Britain, and it means two in, uh, in England, or in America. So you'll be surprised how things don't translate very well. A good test would be print out your, if you're going to use icons, print them out and ask a few people to tell you what they think they mean. That'd be a good start. <coughs> uh, now that we just talked about specific components, that now you're going to lay them out on the form in, in different places. The key, the key concept here is the uh, dominant reading order of the people that are going to be using, you know, the culture that's going to be using your program. In, uh, in America, we read left to right. So when we look at programs, we tend to look to the upper left, you know, up there, as a starting point. So the most important thing, the first step in the task, often should be up there. Also, uh, frequency of use. You look at the most common things, people read uh, left to right and then down the page. So on the uh, upper left, that should be the first thing, to the right of it should be the next thing and so on. Or at least that's the rule, you can think about it, but that's where people will gravitate. <clears throat> okay, we are going to uh, talk about, uh, take a look at some different um, uh, different projects, and I, I redesigned a couple, and we'll critique some others. But the first thing I want to do is tell you that my stuff is weak too. Okay, at times, and I wanted to give you uh, uh, give you an example, we'll tear apart my own stuff before I start talking about anybody else's work. Yes. The uh, question was, when you're putting, and tell me if I, I got this right, uh, if you're putting a man or help section associated with your, your program, where do you draw the line on like, t referring the user to that area? My, uh, my recommendation would be you give them some immediate feedback, a small, you know, clear, concise, hey, what the issue is, and then um, a common technique is you put a link to more information if they want more information, something, something along those lines. <clears throat> These are uh, two programs I wrote several years ago, uh, and I was, I was into uh, usability and interface design at the time and, and put some thought into it, but I did do some things to them that I would, uh, I would make differently, I would change now. Uh, this is a frequency counting program, and the idea is for basic manual crypt analysis. It'll, it'll go through a text file and uh, count up the characters and display a, a graph, a histogram um, of the results, so you can see where the most uh, frequently, frequently used characters are. The idea is that what's the, the logical task that I'm trying to accomplish? I'm trying to take a look at a text file, calculate some frequencies, and see the results. So where did I put my button? To, to the first step where you select the file that you're going to use. I made it very small in the lower, lower right corner. What I would change is I would move this whole bar off to this side because the dominant reading order people would look over there first. 
and I would put this select file very big up here because that's the first step. Underneath it, I would put the calculate frequency uh, button because that's the next step. I would also, and you've seen, I think everybody's familiar with that you can gray out buttons or gray out menu items when they're not active. I would make the select file active because that's the first step and the calculate frequency grayed out until you've selected a file. So it prevents the user from doing something they can't do. You can't do calculate the frequencies if you haven't loaded the data. <clears throat> this is a, another variant where I want to take a binary file and, uh, and do the same thing and take a look at 0 to 255 and again drew, do a histogram across, uh, did a histogram across the top. Uh, but again, I made the same error. I put the uh, select file options down at the bottom. I would make those changes. And I made a conscious decision, and I understood it was uh, probably, for, for me it worked. Can you read this? Can you read the results? No, I used the smallest, barely legible font size to fit it all in. Uh, for, that was a conscious decision. You, th another way that I'd probably do it differently now would uh, filter out the results that didn't apply. You know, a lot of these that were zero, you could gray those out. You could have it pop up in another window with larger, and you could scroll through the list or something like that, maybe sort the results on different columns. And I went out and asked the, actually asked the artist for the permission to use these, and the links are down there, so there are other interesting graphics. First off, I want to make it very clear that the, the programs we're talking about are te uh, great works of technical expertise. All right? there, people put a lot of effort and a lot of time into it. And I'm here because I use these tools. I've used them to teach. And I want to contribute something back. Okay? So I'm not getting on anybody's case trying to take cheap pot shots. Like I said, my own stuff has plenty, plenty of errors. But you know, we as a community can move forward. So uh, I thought when, uh, when new could be a good starting point. And uh, what's the task here? What, what are people trying to do? Yeah, you're, you're trying to uh, nuke a Win95 box. So what are the components of the task? You, you enter an IP address, you enter in a message, and you click the button. So what I tried to do, you know, thinking back to the, th the topics we talked about, I tried to redesign it. And I put a small uh, initial state up there and then a bigger one. And some of the, the thought I went into it is I tried to make the uh, labels a little more intuitive. And again, this is a bit of overkill on a, on a straightforward program like this. Made the font sizes bigger, made the uh, text box bigger, and then one big honking nuke button, and tried to line everything up, put the labels close to uh, the items they refer to. Uh, this is a, another example, and this is a Netboys, uh, Netbus uh, 1.6. Uh, there's a Netbus 1.7 where the interface is very much similar, and then they've come out with a totally redesigned interface, so a greatly uh, streamlined interface uh, for the Netbus Pro. So uh, I took this. What do you think about this? Anything jump out at you? Yeah, lots and lots of buttons, and I, I use this in the classroom and had people um, try and figure out what you know use the, use it for the first time, uh, and they, you know it's kind of confusing. They have different functionality mixed in together. So uh, what I did was a, a simple redesign. When you look at the task, you're trying to connect to a server, so you need an IP address. Where you just enter in the IP address, you connect to the target, and then you, the remote activities area it, button is in, until you're connected is uh, grayed out. Then if you look at the next one, um, you click connect, the red uh, turns to a green arrow, points them towards uh, the uh, remote activities, and uh, away you go. So then it pops up, and I've grouped the uh, different activities on a separate pop-up window. So I hid the functionality till it was relevant, and that's what this is, the, the, pop, the next window that opens. And I've grouped it by, and I sat down and put some time into it, trying to think about how to logically uh, group the things. And I, this is just a partial imp implementation. I just want to show you, some of the, uh, illustrate some of the concepts we were talking about. And another thing, I, a decision I made is up there, I decided, before I had the, uh, on the first version, I had the connect button 
um, be, you connect it, you click once, it connects, you, you click it again, it disconnects. But uh, what I did is uh, separate it out where one will gray out and one will, will turn on based on whatever state you're in. <clears throat> okay, um, sub seven. What are your thoughts? What's that? Uh, yeah, it's a lot better than Netbus. The, the things are grouped into a menu. Um, and that's what I thought would be something that would be interesting to take a look at. Again, I, I used this to teach, so I, had, I stood over people as they tried to use Sub7. And uh, I broke out the menu here. Uh, can anyone tell me the difference between advanced, miscellaneous, fund manager, and extra fund as the menu options? So something to think about if, I, if you're going to redesign this would be to take a look at uh, what, what the options are underneath those uh, underneath those uh, those areas and, and make the change labels around a little bit to make it a little more clear. That would be my recommendation. Uh, Superscan uh, by Foundstone. Um, uh, they, they put a lot of thought into the interface. And you can see they, they did things a little differently. They have a clear background. They group things together into uh, logical groupings. And they have a host name lookup. It depends on you know their usability testing. Who, uh, what's the first step in this process? Is it entering an IP address? If it was entering an IP address, I would probably put the IP area up here as the first step, and try and fo follow the logical flow. If things don't need to be there, if there's some options, and you see this on other programs, if there's all sorts of advanced options that people never use or rarely use, then you can hide them, put them under an advanced option area, get them out of the way, prevent people from getting confused. And I, again, I want to reiterate, these people have written some, some awesome code. It does amazing things. They give it away for free. So um, I, I'm really, you know, like I said, th they've done some amazing work. <clears throat> this example of Zone Alarm, which is a, uh, you know, it's a given away by Zone Labs. And what their purpose is here, and it's a good example of conflicting goals, okay? Because if you're trying to make money with your software, this thing is half ad for Zone, uh, Zone Alarm Pro, and it's also a firewall. So they've mixed in this functionality. It can be very painful. Very, you think you have this option. All it does is pop up an ad that says, if you had clicked this button in Zone Alarm Pro, it would have done what you asked. So there are trade-offs that you'll have to be conscious of. <coughs> All right, where to go for more information? Uh, the one book I'd recommend that's written for people who actually do things, uh, write, write code, it's very well written, lots of real world examples, very light on the painful uh, theory underneath is uh, the GUI bloopers book here. And I'm, I'm not getting kickbacks or anything like that from any of these people. I've read all these. And I, I, Jeff Johnson's GUI bloopers, if you read one book, it can be, uh, it'd be time well spent. If you're interested in in, de in design, in a, in a like not just um, not just user interfaces, but big picture design, how things are. Um, well, a good example is: Has anyone run into a door? You, you go to the and okay, I'll tell you, I have. I've got, I've hit doors. They, they swing. You think they swing one way? A Caesar's Palace has a big handle on the door, a big honking handle this big that looks like you should pull it, and they have a little label over the top that says push. So he's, it's filled with examples like that. that again, that's one of the classics. It's, it's quick reading. <laughs> again, separating us from our money. The humane interface is the next level below GUI bloopers. So I'd probably read them in the order I, I just uh, went through them. Uh, information visualization is, is another area that I've I found a lot of people who are into, into programming, enjoy, enjoy these books. This is Edward Tufte. He's uh, the, the, a classic. These are, it's, this whole field is art and science. So you, he, um, his books are half art book, half science, and they're very interesting, very, uh, very highly rated and fun to read. He also has a, a traveling road show that I went to. And if you can get your employer to pay, for example, they'll uh, buy, the, the, all three books are included. And uh, again, that's time well spent. He, uh, a good example that he uses is the uh, Challenger explosion. He shows the actual slides that the engineers use to brief the, the, the managers, uh, the decision makers, to whether to launch Challenger or not. And 
uh, it, it was clear there was no way you could figure out from what the, how they displayed the information that they could have made a logical choice not to launch. But then applying some of the techniques he, he goes over, um, very, uh, very powerful stuff. And it's clear there's a problem that the O-rings fail at certain temperatures. And then just some other books that you can uh, take a look at if you're interested. And there's websites associated with uh, all of these as well that have some uh, good information for free. Uh, Web Pages That Suck by uh, Flanders and Willis, as well as uh, Two by the Great Satan, Jacob Nielsen. And if you're interested in just, you know, again, engineers and design don't necessarily go hand in hand, but I'm throwing this out here. Uh, the Non-Designers Design Book, our uh, Non-Designers Design Book is a good starting point as well if you just want some basic concepts. It, it reads very quickly. If you're interested in deep knowledge, the, the next level below what we were talking about, uh, uh, designing the user interface by Ben Schneiderman at the University of Maryland is a good, it gives an end-to-end -end coverage of the whole field with lots of deep links into the actual research of why those rules exist. And then if you're looking for cutting edge stuff, that's where you get into the Association for Computing Machinery, um, the Specialist Interest Group for Computer Human Interaction. And uh, those conferences, that site will point you toward other conferences of the cutting edge stuff. All right, that's all I have. And I've got a couple of minutes. What are your questions? What? Yes. The the question was, um, is there a better way to if you have if you hide things under advanced options, uh, is there a better way to to word that? Extra options. More options. You could put it in a different location, maybe not as visible or something like that. Other thoughts on uh, on how to relabel it? Use very yeah. If they don't know what it means, some like rite of passage wording or something like that. Okay. Uh, what else? Yeah, generally people respond to having light or pale background colors. It's just clearer and easier to understand. Um, people have problems discerning. There's colorblind people, for example, have problems discerning between red blue. There's red blue colorblind, and there's a large actual percentage of people out there. I think it's 10% of uh, people who are red blue colorblind. Uh, uh, what's that? 14%. Um, if green letters on a back, black background can be very hard to read. Um, you know, take a look at it. I mean, it, there's a certain, you know, if you're designing it, that's fine. If you want it to look like that, that's fine. I've seen it work quite well if you're trying to emulate the old, old school, um, you know, CRTs or something like that. Uh, but understand it is easier if the background's like white or very pale colors with dark letters, like black letters, that, that's easier to, to uh, understand. Yes? Yes, and that's that's the idea um, that you you place it based on if they someone reads right to left, that's where the most dominant controls are. It's awkward for us as as uh, English speakers, as Americans, to to feel comfortable with that. But that's what the uh, the design you know that's what's been proven to work better for those people, and it, it'll be in their language. I mean, if it's an English version, well, yeah, I mean, generally be in their language it would make sense. Okay, okay, got it. I, th I think it depends on, on who your market is. If, if you're looking at a, uh, a market where you want a different tier of users to actually have ability to use the program, uh, that, uh, that can be worth the cost. That if, you, if you're trying to sell to a different market that isn't comfortable with the command line, that could be worth the cost because they wouldn't be able to use the command line. Um, another way to look at it too is uh, if, if someone else comes out with a product that has the same functionality and it's easier to use, that they could have an advantage in the marketplace. Okay, I'll, I'll take one more question if anyone has one. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, what's a good percentage? Uh, the question was, at what, at what point along the design process do you bring in users to take a look at what you've done? And really, from the start, I mean, once before you even you know, hit one key, you bring your users in. Some people actually bring a user in on the design team um, you know, and let them work with the designers, a domain expert, that they're, they're comfortable. They're gonna, they and their peers will be using it, so you can bring them in early. So really, the best answer is through the whole, the whole thing. Earlier is better than later. Um, and earlier is cheaper than later as well because you don't have to go back and make changes. So uh, that's all I've got for you today, and uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>